Thank you, Van. You sound Thank awesome. You, Pastor. All right. You might not know this, but today is Low Sunday. Okay. Sunday after Easter, nobody comes to church. Bless you're a serious Christian, okay? It's also known as National Associate Pastor Preaching Day. But our associate said that I had to preach, so... Um, hey, I forgot to give Clark my Bible verse, and so I, I'm going to share with you 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you have now. I think it's right to refresh your memory for as long as I live. I'm going to remind you of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Well, today I want to talk about the Easter routine. See, somebody pulled me aside and said, Pastor, now that Easter's over, what's next? And I said, wait a minute. Um, Easter's not supposed to be over. It's just getting started. Uh, the resurrection life that Jesus has made available, it, it should have the church overflowing. Which reminds me of the squirrel epidemic that happened in one town. Squirrels everywhere. You know, it was a problem for every church, and so the Presbyterians, they called the church meeting, and after deliberating, concluded that squirrels were predestined to be there, and they just lived with the infestation. The Baptists, they connected a slide to their baptistry, so the squirrels would slide down it and drown themselves, but they didn't know that squirrels knew how to swim, and they invited all their friends, and so every squirrel in town was enjoying the new slide. At the Methodists, they were not in a position to harm anybody, especially any of God's creatures, so they trapped the squirrels and they released them over at the Baptist church. <laughs> the Catholic church, they just welcomed them in, they baptized them into membership, and now they only see them on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and for some reason, the Jewish synagogue, they didn't seem to have a problem at all. Apparently, the rabbi took the first squirrel and circumcised him and never saw another squirrel. So let me ask you an important question. Was your week any different after celebrating Resurrection Sunday? Did the news that Jesus is alive impact your routine? Because it's supposed to. You know, for many of us, our routine consists of waking up in the morning to a cup of coffee, rushing into the shower to get ready for work. If you have kids, they need to be awakened and dressed and fed, and we gather the homework and we take them to school. Then we rush off to our employment, and then once the day is done, we face the rush hour traffic, we pick up the kids, we have them do their homework, we do some chores like paying the bills, getting dinner prepared, we finish any work that we brought home, we spend an hour checking Facebook, and then we collapse into bed so that we can do it all over again tomorrow. And, and rather than settling into the same old routine, we need to launch into the resurrection routine. You see, Jesus offers a different way to do life. It's life with God. And, and first, we make the conscious choice to invite Jesus into our day. Okay, instead of giving God the leftovers of the day, we usually launch the day. Uh, Lamentations 3.23, His mercies are new every morning. I'm always leaning on you. Read a chapter of the Bible a day. Open it up and see what the Lord has to say. Spend a little bit of time praying about your children, about the day's affair ahead. Offering yourself to God. Lord, what might you want to show me of yourself? Or what might you want to show yourself to others? through me. And inevitably, we encounter a problem at work in our personal lives. And friends, this is when 
We hand the problem over to God because we know he loves us and he cares about us and he's going to help us solve whatever problem it is. Then we go home and we bless our children. We pray with our spouse. We share our spiritual life with others. This is the routine of having God intertwined into every part of our day. You know, this week is my 25th wedding anniversary, okay? So far, I got my wife a bag and a belt. Hopefully, this will get the vacuum cleaner fixed. (laughs) And herein lies many of the problems that we men have, okay? You know, our relationships might need a new routine. In fact, I'm going to argue that if your routine isn't working right now, maybe you need to initiate some fresh habits. How about bringing Jesus and his love into the routine with your spouse? You know, I read an article that says women do most of the reminding to get stuff done. Can you believe they actually pay people to do research like that? I mean, do we not know that? I mean, it's called nagging. I told my wife, you know, I heard you the first time. You don't need to bring it up every six months. (laughs) But actually, the research indicates that men benefit more from being married because our partners remind us of tasks that we've already committed ourselves to. Okay? They know what we're about, who we want to be, and they're there to be our support and and, and to launch us and, and, you know, praise God for our wives. But, but the Spirit of God also works by way of reminder. As I read from 2 Peter, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing of you. And I'm always going to remind you of these things. I consider it right that as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by the way of reminder. See, we know Jesus is alive, but we forget this. And we fall back into the same old routine. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, keep these words posted on your doorposts and and keep them on your forehead. And and what's intriguing is when you go to Israel, you see devout uh, um, rabbis and they have little boxes on their heads. Seriously, little boxes. And you look at that and go, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was symbolism in the Bible. You know, are you really that too literal maybe? Or is it possible that some things are too important to forget? You know, God complains in Jeremiah 2.32, my people have forgotten me days without number. And you want to know something? God doesn't want you to forget what he's done for you and the promises he's made available for you. And the number one thing he wants you to remember is that Jesus is alive You know, the Bible tells us that many people saw him. In fact, 500 people saw him at once. Uh, But but really, that's nothing. I mean, how many of us have stories of Jesus answering our prayers and doing the miraculous? Some of us have actually seen the Lord. And, And I find it baffling when somebody comes along and tells me, God is just a concept. I'm like, are you kidding me? Let me tell you what happened on Tuesday. You know, he's not a concept. He's alive. He's real. And when you engage the living God, you're going to see how real he is. He's interested in moving in you and through you. And I think the reason that a lot of Christians don't experience this is because we've succumbed to the question, why did this bad thing happen to me? Let's be honest. Nothing can put you in neutral more than something going wrong. And we get angry with God, and that's when the block occurs. And the first thing I want to say is, you know, Jesus told you, in this world you will have tribulations, okay? And you can deal with it in many different ways. Some people just endure the whatevers of life, okay? And a lot of people do this. They're emotionally and spiritually in neutral. You might say that they're sleepwalking through every day because of the bad things that have, have occurred. And talking about sleepwalking, sleep is a $32 billion market in our country. 
You know, the mattress and pharmaceutical companies are making a killing on our sleep patterns. And the fact is, just about everybody's exhausted. Voltaire said, heaven gave us two things to deal with the miseries of life. Sleep and hope. And right now, many people are choosing sleep because they've lost hope. In fact, our secular world teaches that there's no God and there's no afterlife. Uh, Bertrand Russell, he was a brilliant thinker, but he made no room for God in his thinking. He, he struggled to figure out the mysteries of life, and he once said, When I die, I believe I shall rot, and that's the end. All the labors of the ages, the inspiration, the noontime brightness of human genius, they're destined to extinction. The whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried in the debris of a universe in ruins. Now there's something to cheer your day, huh? But here's the thing, when you exclude God from your thinking, there's really no other way to think. And this is when the resurrection routine comes along and gives you another alternative, that God's alive, willing, able, and interested in moving in your life. You know, another way people handle the, the everything's going wrong is they get angry with God. They push them aside and say, I'll do it myself, God. Thank you very much. And I was surprised to learn that in Silicon Valley right now, almost all the CEOs are spending huge amount of money on biohacking. These are techniques such as young blood transfusions, DNA data mining, anti-aging super pills, brain drugs, high-tech fasting diets. You see, they're all trying to extend their lives. They're trying to break the cycle of life and death. And I guess when all you have in this life is this life, you're going to spend your billions trying to hang on to it. But friends, God wants us to live with him in eternity. You see, in his eyes, our last moment here is our first moment with him in heaven. That's why it says in Psalm 116, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. But more importantly, God doesn't want us to live longer here on earth under sin's dominance. And this is what the resurrection's all about. God is alive and able to redeem your mistakes, to transform your crises. Yes, you will have tribulations, but he says, I have overcome the world. And I found this cool little nuance with the resurrection power. It's in the vague term, nevertheless. Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. The Jebusites told David, the blind and lame will keep you from taking Jerusalem. But nevertheless, David took the city. In Psalm 73, when my soul was embittered and I was a beast towards you, nevertheless, I'm continually with you and you hold my right hand. You see, whatever negativity gets tossed at us, nevertheless, God has promised to overcome it, to be with us. He has an answer for it, a solution to it, a plan for our future despite our sour circumstances. We have a nevertheless God. And this is what the resurrection power means. God is going to have the last word in your life, and he's going to move powerfully if you allow him to. See, too often we confine God to our religious world when he wants to break into all aspects of our lives. You know, the resurrection, it's not merely an eternal gift from God. Eternal life is the gift of God himself given to you. It starts now and it goes forth into eternity. Friends, the God that you're looking forward to meeting when you die and go to heaven is available to you right now. Think about that. God can't wait to get started in your routine. And really, Jesus' resurrection life, it's kind of an invasive experience. Okay, George MacDonald, he explains it this way. Imagine you're living in a house, and God comes in to rebuild the house. At first, you, don't, you kind of understand what he's doing. He starts getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof. You know, things you knew that needed to be done. You're not surprised. But then 
he starts knocking around the house in a way that doesn't make sense. You know, he, he builds a, a different house than you thought. He adds a new wing here. He puts a new floor there. He, he raises some towers. He makes a courtyard. You see, you thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage. But he's building a palace he intends to come and live in himself. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Holy Spirit lives in you? That's why he comes into our lives and starts making adjustments. That's not just for your benefit. He's going to dwell inside of you. And friends, what a partner to have in life. You know, Thomas Merton said the biggest human temptation is to settle for too little. I mean, we should settle for nothing less than than faith that moves mountains and calms raging seas. I mean, Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. What's the power that works within us? The resurrection power. Jesus alive within you. That's why. As Paul said last week, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has in store for those who love him. I want you to plan and pray big because you belong to a big God. You know, in my devotions yesterday in 2 Peter, it says we participate in the divine nature. And I thought that was pretty radical. You and I, we participate in the divine nature. See, Jesus being alive means that he imparts the heart of the Heavenly Father to us. We don't have to wonder how God feels about us. We don't have to worry about whether God's going to be with us. We don't have to question whether God loves us or cares about us. Yes, 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 all those issues are settled. We now have continual free access to the heart of God, his unconditional love, and his abounding grace towards you. And what a different attitude to have than the one that we too often settle upon, you know, suffering through days of insecurities and disappointments and fears and doubts and worries. You know, we try to take charge of our lives to feel valued. We fight, you know, so that we'll feel what's owed us comes our way. We struggle against the feeling of not measuring up while all the while God is trying to establish you in his love based not on what you've done, but on who he is, the God who redeemed you into a forever relationship with him. Friends, I want you to hear me. When you seek God, you're not going to be met with nothingness. When you seek God, he's going to reveal himself to you, his attributes, his feelings, his purpose. He's available. He's ready to pour into you. It's a tangible experience for us personally, And it redesigns the relationships around us. And I'm going to tell you why the resurrection lifestyle is important. You know, Cadbury, they're dropping the Easter reference to their annual Easter egg hunt. Okay? It's now now called Cadbury's Great British Egg Hunt. See, Jesus is being cut out of his own resurrection moment. Although I never really understood how a bunny that lays eggs has anything to do with Jesus rising from the dead. But here's the deal, the politically correct agenda, it's doing all that it can to eliminate God from our vocabulary. And so the only way the world is going to encounter Jesus is through him living in us, his love being demonstrated through us. You see, the resurrection lifestyle, it doesn't just stop with us, it travels through us. And how does it travel? Francis Schaeffer said, Biblical orthodoxy without compassion is the ugliest thing in the world. See, if we know all the things the Bible says, and yet love isn't pouring out of our lives, ugh, it's ugly. It's not the way it was meant to be. We're supposed to love Jesus by loving those for whom he died. And by the way, for some of you, that means starting with yourself. You know, at the heart, at the height of the segregation storm in our country, a first grader went to her newly integrated school. 
It's the first day, and she went to school, and mom was really nervous and curious. You know, how did, how did the first day go? And she met her little girl at the front door and say, well, what happened today? And she said, oh, mom, I, I, I sat next to a little black girl today. And she said, yes, what happened? Expecting something traumatic. And the little girl said, well, we were both so scared, we held hands all day long. And friends, I, I tell you this story because there's so many people who are going through life scared and hurting. And they need to be introduced to the hand that created them and promises to never let them go. And that's where our hands come into play. When we extend the hand of God's love, that's when they meet them. You know, Mother Teresa shared, we have drugs for people with diseases like leprosy. But these drugs do not treat the main problem, the disease of being unwanted. And that's what Christians hope to provide. The sick and poor suffer even more from rejection than material want. Loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty. Friends, you know that the American male is supposed to be the loneliest species on the planet right now? You know, you can be in a marriage and be all alone. There's a lot of loneliness. It's an epidemic. And there is somebody that will never leave you alone. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's with all of you, and he wants to be with everyone around us. And like I said, resurrection power, it doesn't just come to us. It travels through us. And I guess... This is you and me making the decision to bring compassion to those who cross our path, okay? When you and I decide to share love, this is how we participate in the divine nature and show the heart of the Father. And when we step forward to love, he starts moving, and the next thing you know, it's a supernatural experience. Well, the resurrection... It's a mindset of living in the presence of God at all times. It's keeping God's love story in front of us, his promises before us, his counsel within us. It's when we actualize God in every part of our life, okay? Our thoughts, our actions, our emotions at home, at work, watching movies, at church, out with friends. It's the living Lord continually revealing the heart of God to you and through you. This is the resurrection routine. And I thought I should just remind you about that today. Amen? Amen. So, let's go forward and make sure that this upcoming week is a resurrection week. And then